All right, um, I'm just going to describe this gun. Um, this is one of the later guns that I made. Um, well, this is the most recent gun that I've made, actually. Um, <clears throat> it's the first semi-automatic gun that I ever made. It is blowback operated, uh, 32 ACP. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to simply disassemble it, uh, explain how it works, and I'm not going to get into the whole details of how I got to this point. Um, this was by far the most complicated gun that I'd ever made. Uh, it took a very long time to make it, <clears throat> including many design changes. So it's messy from both a design standpoint and all the things that went wrong and had to be changed. I had three different caliber changes, um, parts breaking, bad things happening. Um, but I eventually got to this point. It works. <laughs> it functions. Um, <clears throat> and I'm decently happy with it as it is. Removable uh, magazine. This is a factory magazine. This is out of a Beretta uh, 3032. It is just a seven round 32 uh, ACP magazine. I have plans someday of making this use a slightly larger capacity magazine. Seven rounds is a bit light for a gun of this size. Uh, it's a decently large gun. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head how, what it weighs, but I will weigh it and add that information to the video for you. <clears throat> but it's all steel for the most part. Uh, just this piece under here is aluminum that uh, just acts as a trigger guard and holds the grip on. That's the only aluminum thing on this gun. Everything else is steel. Well, the trigger's brass, but everything else is basically steel. We have a kind of fake tangent sight. It's not adjustable in any way, and it's also a little bit wobbly. Um, but it does work, and this is a relatively accurate as far as my homemade guns go. You can reasonably hit to, you know steel plates at 15, 20 yards. Um, that's about it, though. <clears throat> and just simple blowback operation. So let's get to assembling it. Okay, so here we kind of see the uh, first start of some of the complexity of this gun. Um, there's quite a bit going on here. So you have a trigger, trigger spring. Trigger rotates on a pin that is up underneath this linkage, this lifter bar. Just pivots around here and pushes up on the sear, which is right there. So, and this kind of angled linkage is the disconnector. So when I pull back the trigger, this pin pushes on the disconnector, which tries to, well, it pushes up on this pin that connects the disconnector to the lifter bar. That pin is not attached to the frame. That pin just connects the disconnector and the lifter bar, and all of this stuff is mirrored on the opposite side of the gun. There's two disconnectors, two, well, two, the trigger is just both sides, has a yoke, goes on the other side as well. <clears throat> lifter bar is another lifter bar, this pin on the sear goes the whole way through. Everything is in duplicate. Excessive, I know. When you pull the trigger, it pushes on this disconnector, pushes up on this pin. The whole lifter bar rotates around this pin, which is attached to the frame, pushing up on this pin, which connects to the sear, which pivots on that pin, lifting the sear up out of the way, firing the gun. Got my hammer. Simple. <clears throat> the way disconnector works is there's a roller up in here, kind of like a roller locked gun, which is actually what this was originally designed as. And then I had to deliberately defeat the roller locking in order to convert it to blowback when I made some couple series of caliber changes and dramatically reduced the power of the gun. So the roller is now not quite far enough up into the bolt to actually lock the bolt, and it's on an angled surface instead of the flat surface that ordinarily would have locked it. <clears throat> so the bolt can just be pulled back simply, and you notice that the upper receiver no longer articulates. It's on rails. It was designed to move relative to the frame, but I now have some spacers and a bolt in here that fixes the upper receiver relative to the frame when I convert it to blowback. <clears throat> so when you pull the bolt back, the roller rolls out of its notch in the bolt, and that pushes down on the disconnector, as you can see. Disconnector out of the way, you can pull the trigger and the sear. Obviously, the safe hammer is staying where it is. So that is how the, that's how the disconnector works. 
very simply. Um, no bolt hold open, just like the original guns. Uh, it just kind of gets caught on the hammer, and you can either pull down on the hammer to release it, or just kind of give it a whack. Works fine either way. Um, when the gun actually fires, if it happens you know fast enough, see it doesn't it doesn't get stuck. There's enough momentum that it just kind of rides right over that little hump. But if you do it deliberately, it stays put. And it's you know it's decent. It stays there. Um, you kind of have to deliberately put the bolt down. Um, doesn't take too much force on the hammer, but it's a good compromise, I think. This aluminum block here, I guess there's another aluminum piece in here. <clears throat> this is the magazine well. Um, it's a separate piece, which is good because I can change magazines by just changing this aluminum block, and I don't have to change the rest of the gun. The magazine simply fits inside of there, locks, <clears throat> there's your magazine release. Pretty simple. This up here is the ejector housing. The ejector is spring-loaded, actually. Um, there's a slot on the bottom of the bolt. Well, I'll take the bolt out, and uh, then I can show you how that works. Okay, so first thing I did is take out these two screws, which connect to the recoil spring, which is inside of the bolt, just like the original. And then these two set screws just back out, and this lug can be removed. That lug <coughs> is effectively the rear travel limit uh, of the bolt, and the buffer uh, keeps the bolt from flying out the back of the gun, um, which happened a few times. So with that out, the bolt just comes right out easily. Um, <coughs> so we see we have an injector, which is not actually um, spring-loaded per se, uh, it just flops around in there, but when in the gun, the inside of the upper receiver presses down on the top of this <coughs> and keeps it from lifting up, and that makes it effectively act as a little leaf spring there. So here we see the recoil spring and the firing pin inside of the recoil spring, and then there's also a recoil pin spring inside of that. This yoke, which stays with the bolt, uh, unlike the original, pushes on the recoil spring, compressing it when you pull the bolt back, <clears throat> and those two screws fit into that. The recoil lug fits into this groove and runs back, and this is just a cut-up O-ring that sits there and acts as a buffer. When this hits the back of it and pushes on that O-ring, that is your recoil buffer. That's what gives you a bit of uh, cushion at the back of the bolt travel to keep it from the breaking things. Here's that semicircular cut for the roller, which is a roller. Fits inside of there. Um, when the bolt comes back, cams out of that. And that's what pushes on the disconnector. In the original design, that also would have locked the bolt. On the bottom, here is the ejection uh, the ejector groove, the ejector rides in this groove. Now, what you may not be able to see is that there's an additional cut right at the front. This groove is not very deep for most of its length, and then it gets a lot deeper right at the end um, in order to get up far enough to actually tip the case over. But I couldn't make it deep the whole way because it would end up inside of this uh, area where the recoil spring is. So the ejector is spring-loaded, and it pushes up against the bottom, and when the bolt's coming back, when it gets to here, the ejector is able to push, protrude further into the bolt, hitting the case and knocking the case out. Um, and that works. I've never had an issue with it. It works just fine. Um, I had issues with getting the ejected shell out of the gun. That's what some of these cuts here are for. Uh, just adjusting the area where the case hits into and how it flips back hits that and gets launched out of the gun. Um, once I made those adjustments, it tends to eject pretty reliably. Um, the biggest issue with this gun really is the whole disconnector system. It's pretty complicated. A lot of these pins aren't well retained. That's what this screw here is for, actually. It does some, keeps the symmetrical pieces together. Um, it's, it's complicated, it's excessive, it's not great. Um, but it works. Um, perhaps I should mention the hammer spring is slung under and inside of this frame. This frame, if you can't tell, is 
an incredibly complicated piece of machining. There's just so many features, so many milled out areas for weight savings, for additional things that aren't even used, like this whole thing up here was for a separate spring and rocker assembly to push on this pin for when it was short recoil action, the upper receiver would uh, move back and forth. That's obviously not in use anymore. And the main spring, like I said, is inside of the center of this frame, kind of slung underneath there um, in the hammer. And push on that. Uh, no safety. Uh, there was originally intended to be one. That's what this kind of milled area right here is for. But I never ended up implementing it. And being, you know, obviously single action for a shot, it's not too much of an issue, I don't think. Um, let's try to get this back together. That's it, basically back together again. Okay, and uh, that should be about it. Um, perhaps I should also mention the bluing on this. Um, it is not cold blued like most of my original, uh, my early guns were. Um, this is flame bluing. I just heated it um, up to somewhere around 800 degrees or so, seven, 800 degrees, and then just let it cool down. Um, sometimes people will do that by heating it very hot and then dunking it in oil, which works. It gives you a much darker kind of color. I suppose I don't really have anything good to demonstrate, but it gives you kind of a very, uh, it's kind of like this. It gives you kind of a very blackish appearance. Um, from the, I think it's from the carbon in the oil that gives that black appearance. Not sure. But if you just heat it up, not too terribly hot, um, not don't get it all the way to glowing. Just go somewhere around 800 degrees and then just let it cool naturally in the air. You get this kind of rich navy blue color that almost has hints of like green in it, um, at least on low carbon steel. You notice the barrel and actually also the sight, which are made out of high carbon steel. Um, they don't get that same navy, you know, very, I think it's a very pretty dark blue color. They get almost like a almost a very deep purple, like almost like a plum, but certainly more gray. It's like a grayish kind of plum color that you get on the barrel um, and on the rear sight as well. The ejector was done similarly, but it wasn't gotten quite as hot, so it kind of has that a little bit more of an iridescent bluish purple kind of color to it. It wears off very quickly because of the way it rubs on the receiver, um, but overall, pretty good. The aluminum is just painted, by the way. Grips are made of oak. And obviously the hammer and the bolt were left in the white. Um, they're still just carbon steel, though, as with the ejector button. All right. I think that should be it.